there. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all and uh, be back with you again. Um, when Dave and Joe and the Red Cloud team were kind enough to invite me out last year, I talked about where we saw the bottlenecks in the EV supply chain. And I thought I'd follow up that uh, this year with a bit more in-depth discussion about exactly the scale of those bottlenecks um, and what exactly is going to be required in terms of financing to de-bottleneck some of those issues and support this emerging push towards clean energy. Um, but to kick things off, I really wanted to take a, a sort of macro view of what's driving the interest, the, the um, drive towards a lot of these more niche critical minerals and metals. And that, of course, is the push towards sustainable energy. Um, people often throw around the term the energy transition. I myself am guilty of it. But of course, the energy transition isn't one thing. This is multiple energy transitions taking place at the same time. Um, from everything from your legacy energy, oil and gas, through to emerging types of energy generation, wind, solar, um, right through to new emerging technologies like fusion, fission, this type of stuff. And all of these lines and streams of energy transition are going to play uh, an important role in the future landscape of the energy market. But most importantly, we think the shape of that energy landscape will be defined by the ability to store energy. The ability to store that energy is ultimately what is going to decide the efficiency and the economics of different streams of this energy transition. And for that reason, the production of batteries, but more importantly, or increasingly importantly, the build out of the supply chains to support those batteries is really um, at the heart of this global energy transition. So the question that often gets thrown to us when, when we you know, make the point about the, the importance of batteries as a platform technology in the energy transition is, well, what do we really need to do to scale these batteries? How big, how much scale do we need? How many batteries do we need out there? Um, and luckily for, that, for us, you know, we've had big organizations, the IEA have thrown some numbers into this, various different NGOs. Um, also, you know, of course, Elon Musk earlier in the year, Tesla put out their announcement um, of the master plan um, earlier in the year. And really what that did was lay out a pathway towards a net zero society by 2050, which really centered around, as well as the, the change in the energy mix, centered around the deployment of up to 240 terawatt hours of batteries into the market um, by 2050. So we took that number and you know sort of worked it back uh, as we do at Benchmark and focused on the supply chain. Um, when we thought about this number, you know, it, it, it rose um, um, pretty stark increases across these markets that are going to have to take place to support that type of um, trajectory. So, you know, most notably when you think about how much energy storage will have to be built out, we're looking at a 14x growth on where we are today um, by 2040 to, in order to sustain that push and that development through to 2050. So a massive transformation in the number of batteries, which as I'll come on to show, is already to some extent underway, but is a huge scale for when you compare where the market is today. Uh, beyond that, of course, you then have to think about what is the mix of those batteries that are going to come to market. They're not all going to be the same thing. They're not all going to be the same technology. They're not all going to be the same chemistries deployed. And that really impacts the intensity and the volume of raw materials that will be required to support that type of battery production. So when we work this back and, and applied some assumptions across the mix of those technologies and chemistries going forward, what we saw that was that across the most critical raw materials in this energy transition and energy storage build out, um, you are going to need these total industries to scale somewhere between anywhere between two and a half times and 10 times uh, between now and 2040 to sustain that level of battery production. So this is transformational growth across what in many cases are quite niche mineral and metal markets today that are being asked to scale to um, the energy transition commodities of the future over the course of the next decade or so. And of course, all of this now has meant that critical minerals and these, this group of, of critical minerals and metals that are going to sustain that growth are very much at the heart of, of global geopolitics now. Um, when you look at the announcements and the commitments that continue to be made um, across the world, but most notably, of course, in Western economies, if you look at what's being put out just in the past 12 months in Europe, in the US, here in Canada, of course, 
all of this is is really about protecting the energy interests of major economies around the world and batteries are firmly now at the heart of that discussion but beyond that and beyond the commitments being made in, in major western economies what you're now starting to see is countries around the world looking at where they can be competitive and how they can feed in and develop international alliances to feed into that major development in the energy industry. So this isn't just on the, on the case on, uh, for policymakers in the US or in Europe anymore. This is at the heart of global geopolitics as we'll continue to see over the years to come and really puts batteries at the forefront of the question of energy transition. So when we think about batteries and really what's going to drive that growth, certainly in the near term or certainly for the remainder of this decade, the vast majority of that growth will undoubtedly be coming from the automotive industry. And as many people in the room will be familiar with, every major automotive brand now has doubled down on their plans towards electrification committing billions in R&D spend product development and looking at how they remain competitive in this new emerging industry. So the automotive industry has now converged on the battery world. Um, and really that's going to push forward penetration rates. That and the, uh, the policy pressure is going to push forward the push towards electrification considerably between now and just 2030. Our projections now are that by 2030 you'll see some parts of the world like China um, and parts of Europe that will be above 50% EV penetration rates by 2030. And when I say EV, that isn't all just pure electric vehicles, of course, there's hybrids included in that as well. But that shows you the transformational shift that's happening in the automotive landscape. And even in parts of the world that are a bit further behind on that, like here in North America, we're still projecting that one in three vehicles sold in 2030 in, across North America will be some form of electric vehicle. So that shows you how quickly and how vast this transformation is taking shape. But beyond that, of course, the question then comes is how do we produce enough batteries to sustain those electric vehicle producer ambitions? And really that push both at the policy level and at the industry level, now converging around batteries, is ushering a new chapter in the story of this lithium ion battery industry. So I really think of the lithium ion battery market um, to date as sort of playing out in three chapters. The first of those being the, the initial shift from a lab scale prospect of the lithium ion battery through to a commercial reality. We then saw the deployment of those batteries, of course, predominantly in portable devices in your smartphones, your laptops, your tablets. And the third chapter, and we're really what well, I think we're coming to the end of this chapter now, was the beginning of introduction of scale. That's what really sparked all this industry uh, interest in the lithium ion battery industry. Of course, Tesla were very much at the forefront of that, announcing the Gigafactory in Nevada, which aimed to target effectively the size of the total global market under one roof. That was the scale of their intention back in 2014. Now, of course, since that point, it's not just Tesla doing this anymore. There are now up to 400 uh, of these Gigafactories in the pipeline across the world. So a massive transformation has take pl taken place. And really that's pushed us towards the end of this chapter of scale in the industry. We now have scale. 2023 will be the first year the lithium ion battery market exceeds the one terawatt hour threshold. A thousand gigawatt hours of lithium ion batteries will be produced in this year alone, which is a massive transformation if you look back just as recently as 2015. The next chapter is really gonna be defined about around not just continuing to add that scale, but really being able to um, effectively deploy those batteries and scale supply chains so that the economies of scale that have been achieved to date aren't disrupted as we continue to scale this industry. So we need to keep the cost down, we need to keep prices of these batteries at a level that allows for the deployment of this technology across the growing number of applications. Otherwise, if we don't scale those supply chains, the price volatility and the turbulence in the raw material markets that you will see will undoubtedly disrupt the economics of batteries and limit the future prospects. That is really the challenge of the new uh, chapter of this lithium ion battery story. So thinking about that battery pipeline, and like I say, we're now tracking almost 400 
of these battery gigafactories in the pipeline. Um, but I wanted to take one just to give you an idea of the scale of what is exactly going to be required to sustain that type of growth. And I've taken the Tesla Gigafactory, which of course is, is one of the larger in terms of the capacity that they're targeting, but gives you some indication of quite how much these industries will have to scale to meet this demand. So if you take the Tesla Gigafactory in Nevada, which is now targeting a, a total capacity of around 140 gigawatt hours under that one roof, if that was operational today and operating at full capacity, these are the volumes of each of your key raw materials that would be required to sustain that one battery production facility. And beyond the actual tonnages at the top, um, I'd encourage you to look at the, the percentage in the bottom. The percentage indicates the proportion that that tonnage equates to compared to last year, relative to last year's total production in that market. So yes, while those volumes in bigger established commodity markets like aluminium, manganese might only be a fraction of total production in those markets, if you look at some of the more critical raw materials, your lithiums, your nickels, your graphite anodes, this is significant upheaval and disruption into what are today quite niche mineral industries. These need to scale at speed, uh, um, uh, at much faster speeds in order to sustain plants of this and operations of this magnitude. And like I say, the Tesla Gigafactory isn't the only one anymore. We're not talking about two, three of these Gigafactories that are being developed. We're talking about hundreds. So that gives you some indication of the scale of the challenge ahead for these raw material markets. And for that reason, ultimately, where we stand today and because of the slow responsiveness of um, downstream consumers in this industry, what we're faced with today is that by the tail end of the decade across a number of these industries, we're facing significant structural deficits in these markets. Fundamentally, where we stand today, there won't be enough of this raw material reaching the industry to meet those type of demand requirements. And that fundamentally is because the statements that have been made by automakers around the world have put the cart before the horse. They've said, we're going to electrify our fleets without any consideration of, of how big a challenge it is to move raw material markets, and more importantly, the time frames required to move some of these raw material markets. So what this really shows and what the, the reality the automakers and consumers of these batteries are waking up to increasingly is that we need to address the upstream of these markets. We need to get involved much further up the supply chain than we have ever historically done before in order to meet anywhere near the ambitions we have for electrification. So capital needs to be deployed. And I suppose the next question that comes off the back of that is how much capital needs to be deployed. So we did a bit of research earlier in the year at Benchmark and looked at the average, average capital intensity to add new capacity to each element of the supply chain. And then we looked at how much new capacity or new production was going to have to be added between now and 2030 to meet our base demand forecast. I'd emphasize this is our base demand forecast. Our base demand is very different from our uncapped, unconstrained um, demand forecast, which really, if you compile every policymaker ambition, every automaker uh, target, that gives you a number that's probably 20 to 30% higher than this. That is outside the realms of possibility, unfortunately. That just fundamentally won't happen. But if you take our base forecast of where we think we can get to, really what you see is that we're going to need up to $250 billion spent in the upstream across the suite of raw materials. The midstream is going to require a further 100. Uh, I can click here. We need it somewhere in the region of another 100. Excuse me, sorry, Mike. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, another 100 million in the midstream processing of those raw materials. And then finally, if I'm pointing this in the right direction. Uh, finally, we'll need another 200 billion in terms of uh, battery uh, production to scale to this level. So in total, you're looking at upwards of $550 billion that will need to be spent between now and 2030 to meet that type of demand growth. Now, the good news in that equation is that um, not all of that is outstanding, right? We're, we're not starting from scratch here. A lot of this money has at some stage been committed to expansion of these industries. So we're not starting from scratch, but we estimate that only around $350 billion of what's needed has actually been committed to meet that 2030 number. 
and what is, remains is somewhere around the $200 billion figure. And what's notable about that $200 billion is that it's overwhelmingly geared towards the raw materials. That is where the lack of capital is at the moment. Money's gone into new battery production facilities, into EV production, into the midstream of anode cathode. Um, not completely, it's not filled the whole void, but money's gone in there. Where you need a lot more of that 200 billion remaining is to go into these upstream markets to facilitate the expansion of lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite projects around the world. So a huge amount of work still needs to be done. And of course, as, as people in the room will know, uh, better than most. Time is really running out on this. You don't uh, just turn the, turn the key and start a new raw material extraction facility overnight. Even if the money was available today, we'd still be up against a race to meet those type of expansion targets by 2030. So I show this graph, I showed it, I'm sure I showed it last year, I showed it in pretty much every one of my presentations, but I think it tells the story of where we are as an industry. Um, Yes, there's a development time frame and there's a lead time to bringing new vehicles to market, which automakers have that sort of four to seven year development timeline. That's already underway. They know where they want to go with their electric vehicles. Then it's a case of how the other steps in the supply chain preceding that can respond to those type of ambitions. And the issue is, as we move to batteries, increasingly you're becoming dependent on expansion of extraction in completely new industries. And industries that arguably, in terms of the time frame of bringing that new production to market, is actually getting much longer at a, at a time frame when we need to narrow these time frames. So if you think about the, the push towards diversification of supply around the world, moving mining to new uh, jurisdictions, if you think about the new technologies being deployed to extract these raw materials, if you even think about the sustainability requirements that are being now put on material to go into some of these supply chains, all of that compounds the lead time to bringing this new production to market and adds to the urgency that we, we start to deal with this issue of extraction. And on top of all of that, I think, you know, as again, most people in the, the room will be able to attest, even when you get that extraction piece um, completed, the other parts in the supply chain can only start to become more efficient and really move in response to what you know your raw material is. We can't start to refine the processing um, to improve efficiencies downstream until we know what's being extracted. So all of these are questions that have to be overcome for us to get anywhere near the, the targets of the coming decades. So I suppose the question becomes, you know, where is this money actually going to come from? Money that's needed at speed. And of course, it will come from governments to some extent. We're seeing increasingly governments getting involved with this. Um, it's going to come from public markets. It even will even come from adjacent industries. You know, you're seeing oil and gas, you're seeing other types of commodity um, industries now looking at how they can play a role in this industry. But beyond that, and I think where it's most important that this money has to start coming from, and will increasingly come from in our perspective over the years to come, is from the automakers themselves. They're the ones that have now committed multi-billions of dollars downstream to the vehicles that they want to build and committed to electrifying their fleets. Now they're having to deal with the upstream reality of what's needed to meet those ambitions. And we did this infographic with our friends at Visual Capitalist just a few weeks ago, um, really just to signify how important the battery now is in the wider case of EV economics. The single largest cost component going into an electric vehicle is a battery. Um, and if you think about a battery effectively, it's a, bat it's a pack and it's a bunch of cells. About 80% of the cost of that battery comes from cells and about 75% of the, the cost of those cells comes from raw materials. So raw materials now drive the economics of the battery cost going into a vehicle. But automakers have to step up. And they have to step up not just because the actual cost of the batteries going into their vehicle forms a huge part of the, the total cost profile, which it does, as you can see here, anywhere from five to sort of 25% for some producers of the cost of these vehicles they want to bring to market is going to come from your battery. But if you layer on top of that, that a lot of these companies aren't producing the batteries themselves, they're going to have to pay a margin on top. Not everyone is the testers of the world that are trying to do this themselves and capture all of that margin. A lot of these producers have committed to technologies and to get those technologies, they're going to have to work with producers who aren't going to do this for free. They're going to charge you extra money. And that makes it increasingly critical that they play a role upstream to control these costs, because that will dictate whether they're competitive in this field of uh, electric vehicles. 
So finally, uh, I suppose the question is, you know, how do we sort of address this, this economic reality for automakers, for governments around the world, as we, we try not to make these bottlenecks um, completely prevent the push towards sustainable energy? Um, so the model we've seen to date, of course, the China model, not open to many, not a prospect for many countries around the world, but of course, they've just done this by scale, right? So build in, they will come. They put themselves at the heart of not just battery production, EV production, but also in terms of the, all of these raw materials. Where they don't have the raw materials themselves, they've scaled massively the processing capacity, so everything effectively has to go through China. So there's the China model. Um, beyond that, you can look at what companies like Ford are doing, and the more the bigger established brands are able to leverage their brands to a certain extent and pull on who are the, the leading operators at each link in the supply chain and partner with them. And that type of partnership, I think, is going to have to increase because you need that confidence. The midstream participants, the upstream participants are going to need those type of commitments from major brands that they will buy the material so that they can enact these capital expansions. So there's the partnership model. And then beyond that, of course, there's the Tesla model. And I think you know, how many companies are able or willing to do this is still a question. But if you really want to be able to control, have the most control of your battery raw materials, of course, you produce the batteries yourself. You control the raw materials. And this is a model I don't think will be taken by a lot, but I think is when you look at who's going to be competitive in this market, the companies that have more of that integration in their business planning um, are going to uh, be in good stead for the years to come.